All right. Is this on? That was a mixed response. Is this on? Shut up. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Come on, you know how this works. All right, how's everyone doing? All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Jono. Um, I appreciate you coming because I'm a has-been in the Ubuntu community now. So uh, I'm glad that some of you showed up. But luckily, there's other has-beens like uh, Pete Grainer down here as well. Um, today, I want to talk about three things, really. I want to divide this presentation up into three areas. The first thing is to talk about how we got to where we got to today in Ubuntu. Um, how many of you have been using Ubuntu since the very beginning? For some people. So for a lot of the folks here, that's incredible by the way. So for a lot of you here, you won't necessarily know as much about the story of how it came about. And I want to share some of those aspects. The second piece is I want to talk about the future. Like where are we going with Ubuntu? Uh, and share, in my mind, some recommendations about some of the things that we should be doing for it to help for it to be as successful as possible. And then finally, I'd like to get into a bit of a QA uh, and a bit more of a discussion towards the end. So I'm going to try and blast through the first part of this as quickly as possible. So Let's first of all talk about the past. Note the font, by the way. <laughs> so a long time ago in the galaxy far, far away, um, Linux was, was just really starting out, and it was starting to get some momentum. And in my mind, in the year 2000, a star was born in the form of open source. Now, open source had been around for a little while, but I want to paint a little picture of what it was like back then. Um, so I was personally about 20, I think. Um, and back then, open source was becoming interesting in the commercial world. You had companies like IBM started investing in it. And there was a real worry in the community back then, and tell me if, you, if any of you remember this, that Linux and open source was going to be commercialized. And it was going to stop becoming a, being a community thing. It was going to stop being something that we all had an attraction and an involvement in. So there was a real fear about this. And there was various distros kept popping up. There was one called Corel Linux that had a crack at it. There was Progeny Linux that had the crack at uh, becoming more of a consumer, uh, a consumer uh, a platform for people. But they never really took off. And part of the reason for that was because they were trying to replicate the Microsoft model of doing things. Um, and what people wanted was the thing that we all know and love about Linux and open source, which is the community element, but in a way that was addressable to, to, to a wider group. In 2004, Ubuntu sprung up. And I'll always remember I lived in Bur just outside Birmingham, England, a guy called Jeff Waugh, who was very involved in Ubuntu in the early days, and Scott James Remnant did a talk at a Linux user group about it. And it seemed really interesting for a number of different reasons. First of all, that's way too much text on the website. <laughs> Terrible idea. I don't know who did that. But, but what was interesting is it was, it was a fairy tale story how all this came about. There's this guy who looks like this back then. Just savor it for a minute. <laughs> Is Mark in here? Good. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, this, this famous, well, this spaceman who, who was famous in South Africa, who apparently coloring books in schools in South Africa have outlines of him going into space, um, has decided to, to, to build a system called Ubuntu. And what was interesting was that he was a reasonably active member of the Debian community, but me and most of the people I knew had never heard of him. Um, so when he looked into it, oh, this is kind of interesting. But what was really interesting to me was when that first, when Ubuntu first hit the, 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 the wider market, when people started noticing it, because originally it was kind of the worst kept secret in the Linux world. Everybody knew that it was happening, but, but it hadn't hit all the major websites or anything like that, the news sites or anything like that. Was, there was a really interesting set of criteria. First of all, it was built on Debian. And most of us using Debian loved Debian, but it was too hard. You're not going to get your mum and dads to be able to use Debian. So the idea that it was built on Debian meant it had a really strong base. It was, by definition, community oriented. The one thing I'll always remember was that when Ubuntu was first announced, there was a governance model already in place. And it was put in place by a guy, guy called Benjamin Mako Hill, who's a very well respected member of the Debian and free software world. So right out the gate, in this era of worry, of you know, the, the fear of over-commercialization of Linux open source, Open governance was there from day one. And this was real open governance. It wasn't, an, like a, it wasn't a mimic of open governance. The other thing was this notion of a single edition. Mark said from day one, there will be one version of Ubuntu. There will not be a separate enterprise version that has all the extra good stuff in there and a crippled version of the, uh, of the community edition. 
And that open governance was not just something that Canonical was doing. Canonical wasn't really known when Ubuntu came out. It was just a logo and a website that no one knew what it was. But there was, uh, there was an open governance model put in place in those early days that was designed for, for community members. We'll skip over the brown bit. I never had an issue with the brown, but people really didn't like it. Uh, and the other thing is it, it just felt like the right thing at the time. So people were super excited about that. And Ubuntu started gaining more and more momentum. And one of the reasons for that is that Ubuntu made bold and, and complex choices. Back in those early days of Linux, for those of you who weren't around in those days, you couldn't stick a USB stick into a computer and have it display a window. That was just a world of mystery. And Windows have been doing that for years. Ubuntu was one of the first projects to ship that called Project Utopia. In 2006, I joined. Um, and I, I'd been using Ubuntu for, for a while. My previous job was about to wrap up. It was a funded project in England. Um, I'd met Mark a few times and came to speak at an event that uh, some friends and I did called Lug Radio Live. Uh, and I said to him, you know, I, I mean, you know, I'm thinking about moving on. This is something that I could do. And he said, well, I'm about to look at some Ubuntu community manager position, but I don't really think it's for you. Um, and it sounded brilliant. So I, I persisted and uh, had a bunch of interviews and managed to get the job. The last interview was in his kitchen, which was weird. Um, got the job. And in my time at Canonical, these were the releases that I was a part of. And it's a lot of releases. And it, each one of these has got tremendous memories. And going from edgy right up to trusty, the way Ubuntu was back in those early releases and the way it was towards the end of those releases was so different in so many different ways, but so similar in so many different ways as well. Back in <coughs> the early days of Canonical, the company looked like this. Um, wow, that's all squashed. Um, so, you know, we're a very small company, very tight-knit group of people, and really, really passionate. Everybody was really cut from the same cloth. Everyone had the same sense of change in the world and wanted to make a big difference. And it was a really exciting time to be part of Canonical because none of us, we all pretended that we knew what we were doing, but we really didn't. You know, we were just making up as we were going along. And part of it was bringing new and different types of people into the company to, to, to figure out how we could solve some of these interesting problems. And uh, <coughs> can anyone see uh, Mr. Shuttleworth in there? There he is. And um, there I am. Still no hair. Discouraging. Yeah, ben, ben Collins is uh, the next to me right there. Anyway. Um, and back then, Ubuntu was really two things. It was, it was a server edition, there was a desktop edition, and that, that was all we focused on. Uh, I think most of us hadn't heard the word conversion at that point. And, um, and it was very defined into those two areas. And back in those days, the server was kind of like the weird offshoot of Ubuntu. No one, you know, canonical people didn't really pay as much attention to the server, because it wasn't something that most of the company really knew a lot about. And then we started assembling a server team that started bringing, them some, bringing uh, some, some, some expertise into building that piece out. And we started building out, for example, the kernel team. Pete Rainer down here used to lead the kernel team at Canonical and helped to bring a lot of kind of expertise in how we built more of an enterprise offering of Ubuntu. So we, we just continued growing and growing and growing. And we met together in events like the Ubuntu Developer Summit. And we organized, uh, we organized this is the team as it used to be. Um, people organized local events, and people got together and, and did interesting things. And you just notice all the smiles and everybody was having fun. Everybody felt part of something. Everyone felt empowered by it. But what happened was that this logo meant something to all of us. You know, it had gone from being this weird kind of word that no one had really seen before that looks like it was created in a font that would be in a two-year-old's reading book, um, to being something that represented all that was right about building an open collaborative platform. But what was really important was not the, the, the letters, it was this thing. It was what this symbolized that was important to us. And I think what was exciting about this was that everybody who was participating in Ubuntu that day could see a little bit of themselves in it in those early days. And I would argue that to this day, everybody could see a little bit of themselves in the circle of friends. So things were going great. And we were having a great time and everything was, everything, it was not only a blast to be hanging out with fun people doing interesting things and doing meaningful work, um, but it was, it was incredibly rewarding um, to, to get up every day and feel like you're making a difference in the world. But it wasn't, it wasn't all roses. And we had a big challenge ahead of us. Some of you may be familiar with this thing. It's, it's, um, it's basically the adoption curve. So the idea is that when new technologies come out, you get very few people use them down here. And then as they kind of grow in popularity, you see mass adoption up here. And then 
uh, you see like the, the popularity stuff drop off in, in some ways. So here, uh, innovators, a lot of the people in this room will fall into this category and early adopters. The early majority are the people who tend to read sites like Mashable and Engadget. And then the late majority uh, and the laggards are my parents and most of my family. Um, yeah, sad but true. There's a notion within this called the chasm, which is, uh, or chasm, if you can't speak correctly, um, which is basically a gap here which goes from like exciting new projects down here um, to how do you get into that mainstream. And Ubuntu back then was here. It was like, how do we get over that chasm? And this is, this is the failure of hundreds of startups. They never quite get over that. And it's really hard because people think invariably that it's an engineering challenge where it isn't just an engineering challenge. It's a mixture of engineering, and business development, and training, and certification, and all kinds of different things. It really requires lots of people to be firing on all cylinders at the same time. So we were facing the challenge of like, how do we get this, you know, arguably Ubuntu at this point to become the most popular in-demand version of Linux that people were using. You go to you any Linux conference, you see people running Ubuntu. Um, but we were the number three in the world. There was Microsoft and there was Apple ahead of us. And how were we going to get over that? That was the first challenge. The second challenge is what I call the open source paradox. And this is the inherent complexity of how you build impactful, innovative open source software. In the sense that we want open source to be innovative, we want it to do new things, and we want it to be unique and different. But there is an implicit ex expectation in the open source world that we collaborate with each other, that we build things together. And this was really difficult for Ubuntu because we'd release every six months and we continue to release every six months. Um, and, but what was making us different to Fedora or to Debian or to Suva? And what was different back, in, back then is the main advantage that we had was time. We shipped the best stuff first. You got it first in Ubuntu. But within a couple of months, everybody else had caught up. So it was an extremely expensive way of having a unique experience. So I think one of the things that we determined back then was that we needed Ubuntu to become, to become more unique. You know, the, the purest perspective is that a distribution is just merely a way of shipping pieces of software. And I think there's a difference between being just a distribution and being a product. And I think we wanted to make Ubuntu as more of a product, because that's the only way we, realistically we're going to get over the cabin. So we, we were faced with, like, how do we become unique but in a way that's collaborative? The other challenge that we faced was, was scale, not the conference, it's quite a nice conference, um, is that we were building up into a really huge community. Um, lots of people all over the world, hundreds of loco teams, hundreds of developers, uh, a sponsorship queue of people submitted patches that put Daniel Holt, is Daniel in there anywhere? Like no? Um, you know, he was trying to keep, keep a hold of it. New contributions coming in and staying on top of that fire hose. There was so much stuff going on that it was really difficult to maintain that scale. And what was interesting is that particularly around the time of like 2006, 2008, not a lot of open source projects have dealt with that kind of scale. You know, there's this notion of tribes that most people can only know about 100 people that you, you can't keep more relationships going at the same time, you can't keep that many people in your head at the same time. This was spanning into thousands of people. You know, we hit a million people on the forums relatively quickly. Um, so we were dealing with the question, like, how do we deal with the scale that help a to feel personal? And in my position as the Ubuntu community manager, this was something that I wrestled with every single day. Like, how do we help this community to grow and expand and evolve, but make it feel a really personal, a really personal place to be? We don't want people getting sacked by automated scripts. We want the real connection that makes it all love open source so much. Um, so what happened next was that we basically not just focused on the, the desktop and the server, but we started focusing on this notion of convergence. And one thing I've left off here is the cloud. The cloud has grown in tandem with this. I mean, I, I've often thought of Canonical as kind of two companies that are united by the same ethos. Because the cloud side and the and the uh, the conversion side have traditionally been quite different, but Snappy is now unifying some of that in some interesting way. So, get getting to this whole convergence vision that we're all talking about so much, it wasn't like it just Unity A appeared out of nowhere or Unity appeared out of nowhere. It was a very slow iterative approach. And back in these days, which was around 2008, um, we didn't. Well, at least I did. Maybe Mark had a grander vision, but. We had no idea of the notion of conversion. This wasn't something that we particularly considered. We wanted to evolve Ubuntu to be a more unique and distinctive platform. And this happened through a series of different pieces that ultimately meshed together into the jigsaw. So first of all, there were some experiments. Remember this? Ubuntu Netbook Remix? 
So this was for these devices called MIG devices, which don't really exist anymore, I don't think. Um, and this was essentially a new shell for Ubuntu that ran on these devices, because these were little, little um, handheld devices. Um, and it was really interesting the way some of this kind of stuff grew together, and it gave us an, an opportunity inside of Canonical particularly to think about what the optimal Ubuntu experience should be, because most of the work that was going on in the new life was something happening upstream in the um, But then we started dropping some other bits in. So, anyone remember this? The very first the Notify SD. This is the first bit that dropped in that you can think of as the modern Unity experience. This was outrageously controversial when it happened. And it was outrageously controversial because I think in the open source world back then, this notion of distros building something unique, even though it was open source, was just cognitively confusing and weird, and culturally very different. And this is when we started facing some challenges, I think, in the relationship between Ubuntu and some of the upstream communities. Um, even though I can 100% guarantee, put my hand on heart, say that every person I knew who worked on Ubuntu, canonical or otherwise, had absolutely the best of intentions in doing this. And also, everybody who was working in the upstream project at this moment had the very best of intentions too. So, the first thing was, was Notify OC that dropped in with this thing, the messaging menu, which is obviously a very familiar bit of Ubuntu these days. Um, we then had uh, early iterations of Unity, when you had that button up in the top left-hand corner, um, before we had nice icons. Um, and then, of course, you know, we built, built up to, to the Unity that we know and love today. And, of course, you know, we're moving forward now into what, um, what Convergence looks like. We started looking at the initial ideas of what a Convergence uh, platform could look like both under the covers as well as in the user interface. And you can see this with the original kind of Unity 8 um, idea, ideation around what that could look like. And obviously the design today is quite different. Um, but the same basic principles apply of having that spirit that adjusts the face of different devices. So what happened in, in those years that proceeded from those very early days of this exciting new Linux distribution coming out at the, at the right time, at a time when we were a bit worried about the over-commercialization of Linux and it going down the wrong path, to where we are today is Ubuntu is quite a different world than it was back then. And I think broadly in, in the right kind of way. We do have some challenges that I'm going to get to a little bit later on. So the next thing is to look at the future and look at where we're going forward. And I want to delve into this in a few areas. First of all, I want to talk about the bigger picture, but then also to talk about the individual efforts that are going on within within, within Ubuntu. And then, like I say, what's really interesting to me is to get to the Q&A and the discussion. So, this is what you hear about all the time. Convergence and cloud. Um, how many of you were in Mark's keynote earlier today? Yeah, most of you. Um, obviously, he talked about primarily cloud in that, in that keynote, but Mark will also talk extensively about the uh, convergence side. And the thing that I've always loved about Mark is that his passion is genuine in wanting to empower people to do interesting things, to break that digital divide, and to be empowered to do fantastic things with computing, whether that's across their desktop, their phone, their tablet, their cloud, wherever else. Um, and I think that these are still two very interesting goals for us to focus on. In my mind, the cloud piece is an obvious, it's an obvious area for us to compete because the cloud, with the cloud, is all to play for these days. And I'm not an expert on the cloud, but Ubuntu has become synonymous with how people build solutions on the cloud. Convergence is a little different in my mind because I think when I, I always remember that the convergence story at, at, at Canonical is, is as old as my son. <laughs> Basically, I remember that two months after my son was born, I had to drop the CEF where we lost the Ubuntu um, And so I think of it in, 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 the, in those terms. That was three years ago. And um, in those three years, our competitors have, have escalated their efforts. Um, Google are building Android across multiple different devices. Apple are doing the same thing with their platform. Microsoft is doing the same thing with their platform. So convergence is, the opportunity is still there in my mind, but this isn't something we can hang around with. We have to get on and make this happen. Um, otherwise, we're going to get overtaken. Just because Ubuntu is, I think, the universe feels right in Ubuntu. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to necessarily succeed. Um, so when you go to the Ubuntu website, this is what you see. This is the summary of what Ubuntu is. Ubuntu is an open source software platform that runs from the cloud to the smartphone to all of the different things. Um, 
So let's delve into this a little bit further. Um, oops. So the cloud. How many of you are excited about what Ubuntu is doing in the cloud? Hands up. This is one of the things I always find fascinating about this, is that when I go to conferences and talk to people about Ubuntu, what they always want to talk about is the phone and the tablet and the desktop. Because I think emotionally it's something that most people have more of a connection to, because pretty much all of us are carrying around phones in our pocket. Whereas the cloud is something that not necessarily everybody engages with. You don't necessarily, you're not necessarily spinning up multiple cloud instances all over the place. Um, what's interesting to me is that this is where the battleground really is. Like this is where I think Ubuntu has got the greatest opportunity because this is a world that is pretty fragmented and lots of smaller players are driving a lot of, a lot of success. Like Docker was nothing a few years ago and now Docker has become such a major deal in the, in, in the cloud world. And the same thing happened with, with OpenStack when that first came about. I think OpenStack was seen as this kind of weird little platform and now it's become a, a powerhouse in, in the cloud world. So I think this is one of the things where, in my mind, Ubuntu has got so much opportunity. And I would encourage everybody here to go and check out some of the things that Mark was talking about in the keynote today, um, whether it's Maz, whether it's Juju, whether it's Snappy, because this is where I think the opportunity really is lined up. Um, with, 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 with This is where I think the most pragmatic level of opportunity is lined up, and where we're already seeing great wins. Um, we then look at the, the phone, the tablet, the TV, all that kind of stuff. I still think there's a lot of opportunity here, but this is an uphill struggle because the competitors are huge. And how many people here have got a Microsoft phone? A couple of you? I'd like to honor you for your bravery in putting your hands up there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Microsoft have pumped in hundreds of millions of dollars into, into building their convergent platform. And I think most of us would say that they're not really succeeding. Um, when, I remember before I, just before I left Canonical, we did a, a, a competitive analysis of like, the size of the app store for Microsoft, Google, Apple, whatever else, and we assessed like, where we could fit into things. And it's just staggering, the level of growth in those competing platforms. So, but we've always known this. We knew that when we started this down this road, that this was going to be a complex road to go down. Um, but this is, I think, from a probability perspective, less likely to be as successful as the cloud side of things. But in my mind, that doesn't mean that it's not worth doing. Because if we said to ourselves, well, it's unlikely we're going to be successful, therefore we shouldn't bother, we'd have never put somebody on the moon, we'd have never invented Cinnabon. Um, Pick your own favorite example. I like Cinnabon. Um, what's interesting, I think, is here is, is the uh, Internet of Things side of things. And again, it, to me, this feels like a reboot in some ways of what's happening with the cloud. Massively fragmented industry. Everybody's striving to put their, their feet into the game to see what they can accomplish. Um, but it's, it's all to play for. And uh, we don't necessarily know what's going to happen there. What excites me about all of these different areas, and to me, what the, the real opportunity with Ubuntu is, is the fact that it's a consistent platform that flows through all of them. So for people who build products, it, Ubuntu provides not only a great building block, but it also doesn't necessarily muddy the relationship that they might have with other people. So for example, if you look at Google, Google are not just the company that makes Android, they're a company that has a massive services portfolio. So if you are going to be building, a, like the way a lot of people are competing today, is that they're building a product and then they're, they're monetizing it through services. If you are going to be competing with Google at the services level, then that relationship with that partner to build for your operating system is not necessarily going to be as clear cut. Maybe I'm speaking out of terms. Today, I don't really think of Canonical as a services company. I think Canonical is an infrastructure and a platform company. Canonical is not harvesting lots of data and sending it to other people and, and providing services around that data. Uh, Canonical is building tools that people can use. So, Arguably, that opportunity, that strategically, there's, there's a really interesting place where, where I think Ubuntu can sit. Um, well, let's get on to some recommendations. So I want to wrap up some of this so we've got half an hour for a chat. I think it's more interesting than me rambling on. So, in preparing this, I was thinking to myself, you know, 
I, I'm just one person who's had one experience. I'm incredibly thankful for my time at Canonical. I'm, you know, I'm, I continue to be a member of the Ubuntu community, and I'm just, while we're talking about this, I'm super proud of David and Daniel and Michael Hall and the rest of the team for putting the UbuCon together in conjunction with Richard and Nathan and various other people. This kind of event is precisely the reason why I think Ubuntu is such an important thing. So, you know, I think I've had one perspective, one experience, everybody else has had their own perspective and their own experience. And I was thinking before I got here, I was like, what would I say to the audience the things that I think we should focus on and be cognizant of moving forward? And these aren't necessarily right, but these are the things in my mind are the things that we should be thinking about. Because the big challenge that we've got right now is that the opportunity for Ubuntu is massive. And if we don't focus in certain areas and heed certain warnings and industry patterns, we may spread ourselves too thin. And if we spread ourselves too thin, then we might not be successful. So these are five things I think we need to do to try and avoid that. Number one, I think we need to focus on our core opportunity. When you look at Ubuntu as cloud, desktop, server, TV, phone, tablet, Internet of Things, drone, toaster, pen, ruler, whatever, whatever you do. Ubuntu can basically run anywhere. And because Ubuntu can run anywhere, I don't think it necessarily needs to run anywhere, or it necessarily should run anywhere. So I think the first thing we need to look at is what's the real opportunity, being honest, today for Ubuntu? Like, where is the most likely opportunity for us being successful? Because if we, if we can hit the ball out of the park in certain ways, that will open up opportunities in other ways. And I would say that this is what happened back in the early days of Ubuntu. Ubuntu desktop became very successful in the open source world. Everybody started using it, and that opened up opportunities around the server and whatever else. Um, everybody's got their own sense of what those opportunities are. In my mind, the cloud is a very clear element here, and orchestration is a very clear opportunity here. Um, but I don't think it only totally has, I don't think it specifically has to be focused there. I think there is an interesting opportunity on, for example, the conversion devices. My recommendation would be, let's focus on one and get that working really well and not try to do all of them. Let's not try to do phone and tablet and desktop. Let's focus on one thing. Because the Unity 8 conversion experience, while it will run on all these different devices to make it truly classy and, and feel like it's got a lot of sheen attached to it, will require lots of individual work on the apps that work the most specific profiles as well. So my feeling is, let's focus on, like, where's the opportunity? If it's tablet and cloud, for example, let's focus on those two things and help them the second thing is, I think we need to sit down and have a really frank conversation about what we think the community is in Ubuntu today. Because I think this has changed a lot. Back in the days when I joined Canonical, Ubuntu, the Ubuntu platform, the operating system, was our community. Uh, we didn't really have all that many people who built apps for Ubuntu. They were people who just built Linux software, and then it was pulled into the Ubuntu system. And I would argue that I think that the Ubuntu community is contributing to the distribution, the platform, people who are doing development work, Motu, all that kind of stuff. I think that shrunk quite a lot of these um, And I have some ideas around what that might be, uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, I think some people just get excited about other things, some people get bored, some people are frustrated, some people, you know, get married or whatever else. But people move on and for, for other reasons. And while that community, I'd say, has probably shrunk somewhat, we've also had the development of a brand new set of communities. We've got people who are making Juju charts. We've got people who are building apps for the Ubuntu phone and other devices. So we have a fresh new community there as well. So in the session, maybe these five recommendations can be food for thought for the, for the, uh, for the unconference tomorrow. But I think it would be really interesting to think about like, what, what does community mean to Ubuntu today? And more importantly, where do we get our fresh blood from? Where is the next excited new member of the Ubuntu community going to come from, and what are they likely to be wanting to work on? And I think there's lots of opportunities here, but it would be good for us to identify that and then focus on those specific areas. The third thing, we have to do this more. Um, I have a bit of a confession to make. So years ago, we used to do um, Ubuntu developers in the 76 months did them around the world, and it was just an unbelievable thrill to do this. Um, and then we decided, Colin decided that we were going to try to focus on doing those other 
and all of a sudden it's online as opposed to doing them in person. And that was the birth of the Ubuntu Online Summit. And we spent, my team spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to replicate the Ubuntu experience as close as the Ubuntu Development Summit experience as closely as possible in an online setting. Uh, Michael Hall did just incredible work helping to build summit.ubuntu.com and we use this interesting amalgamation of Hangouts and IRC and collaborative text editing to kind of bring it all together. And to a reasonable extent, for those kinds of like sitting down, planning out work, tracking that work, it was really, really successful. They were smaller because when you get everybody together, you can, you know, everyone's in the same time zone, everyone's in the same area. Mentally, you're all focused more specifically. Um, and that's harder, you know, when you're at home, it's easier to be distracted by your family or other things going on. Um, but one of the, one of the, the side effects of, of, of doing that was there was a real, there was a, a loss of the social element. People missed those events, not just because they were productive events, but people missed them because they missed seeing their friends. And one of the things I've learned about community is the social element is really important. So we had the Community Leadership Summit, which is an event I do every year, uh, and David Fanella came out, and Laura Tchaikovsky, and just went back and spoke to the people. Um, and we had a conversation about this, and one of the conclusions that I've come to is that I'd always thought of events as a nice to have for community, but it's, it's cool if you, if you have some, you know, if you have an event that's a, a bonus. And I've come to the viewpoint now that events aren't just nice to have, events are essential part of building a strong community. So, you know, the idea was floated, and, and David worked with Canonical and, and Richard and Nathan and various other people to make Ubercon happen. And even just last night, getting in at 7 o'clock and going to the bar for the pre-event and seeing some people was just so phenomenally rewarding. So I think we have to do this more often. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean Canonical has to pick up the tab. I think there's, I think there's lots of opportunities for us to find sponsors and to find other areas in which we can do this. Um, but we have to get a bit more. I think we need to reduce some ambiguity about certain things. Um, the most obvious thing that jumps out to mind here, for me, is the IP and copyright policy. Um, how many of you have been keeping up with this? Are you familiar? Is, it, is everybody? Familiar? Yes and no. So, to give you the um, probably biased viewpoint, there is a um, Canonical has got a uh, intellectual property and copyright policy, and there is a set of provisions in there about what intellectual property looks like, what copyright looks like. Um, there has been some debate about, as every IP policy has, about whether that's fair, whether that's the right thing, blah, 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 blah. blah. A guy called Matthew Garrett, um, who is a very well respected member of the Linux kernel community and, and elsewhere, has been kind of the key proponent of challenging that policy. Um, now, my view is, and I wrote a blog post about this a little while back, is that on one hand you've got the policy, and I think Mark's reading of that, and then you've got Matthew Garrett's reading of that, and these are the two extremes. I think most people sit somewhere in the middle. Like most of us don't 100% agree with this, don't 100% agree with this. The challenge throughout all of this is that there is not being clear some of the questions that have been raised about that policy have not had clear answers. And my concern is that um, until we have clarity around that, this is going to be an elephant in the room for our community. And I think we need to try and bring clarity to that. Part of the reason why I sympathize with both perspectives is the reason why I think, um, the reason why this is such a complex issue is that, as I said earlier on, Mark and Canonical made a clear assertion back in the early days of Ubuntu that there will always be in a free version of Ubuntu. There will be no separate kind of enhanced enterprise edition. And frankly, when you make that promise, when you make that commitment, you remove a lot of potential business models. Right? So, um, so I, I have some sympathy around, around some elements of copyright assignment and intellectual property. I'm just not sure if that's the right way to make money. But irrespective of what anybody thinks about this, I have my own viewpoint, and I, like I said, I can see both sides, of I feel in the middle. It doesn't matter. I think we just, I think we should strive to find clarity around this. So at least we can then say, okay, we disagree, let's move on. Um, but right now it's a bit of like, he said, she said. Um, and then the fifth thing is, I think what's really important is for us to understand people who are not us. 
Um, so I, when I left uh, Clonazel, I went to a company called Dexprize, uh, which is not really a open source um, software organization. Um, and worked with like totally different people, radically different mindset. Like the idea of a community was just alien to most people there, right? Um, and that wasn't to say they weren't supportive of it, it was just very new. And then after I, I spent some time at XPRIZE and then I went to GitHub a couple months ago uh, to leave the community there. And GitHub is a very different, even though it's a very heavy, you know, technical organization with a heavy open source then, a different kind of community, different kind of perspective. Um, and I think what's important for us to do is to try and figure out like how do people who are not out like us think? What do they want? What do they not want? And how can we cater to their requirements? Because I think for so many years in Ubuntu, we were really building Ubuntu for us. We were scratching our own itch. That's the core open source methodology. Um, but the kind of people we want to write apps for if you use phone or conversion devices, the kind of people who want to write charms, you know, a lot of these people would never come to an Ubuntu conference. They'd never go to scale. They're not people who we would typically consider to be Linux people. And I think if we better understand their needs and what they do and the way they think and what they want, we can better serve them and then we get more people building for them. All right, so um, let's do a bit of Q&A now um, or discussion. So does anyone have any questions about any of this or none of this? Just raise your hand, I'll come right over with the mic. I'd be curious for some of your thoughts and comments about open source and communities as it relates to China. It's clearly a huge growing market, lots of their own software developers. Yeah. Um, I personally do some work there, but you know, I don't know if Ubuntu has a presence there, so maybe you can talk on that and then give some of your views there as well. Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. So um, I think China is a really massive opportunity for us. Um, I think Ubuntu has dipped its toes there with, with Chile, which is a Chinese Flavor, I guess you could say, of Ubuntu. Um, I think there's a couple of different challenges for us to consider. The first thing is culturally, China is just very, very different um, from, particularly from, for example, you know, the West, from like the US, India. So Ubuntu is, I, I, Ubuntu, at least in terms of Canonical, crosses over a couple of cultures. It crosses over the US, crosses over the UK. Uh, Primarily, I'd say, primarily Western kind of influence company. Even though lots of people work all over the world. And for my limited, I do, I've spent a bit of time working with some people in China, and we've gone out there in a few months. It's a very different culture. And I think, not just in terms of technology, but also in terms of how collaboration works. So I think what would be important in embracing China is to not try to get the Chinese people or Chinese enthusiasts to wedge them into our shaped box. It would be, it would be important to understand how, how that culture works and to adapt to it. There is obviously a, a, another question as well around just things like censorship and tooling and all that kind of stuff. But to me, that feels less of an issue. Um, I think the hardest thing is, you know, and I've met, I've worked a little bit with some Chinese companies, and I've met some of the people who worked a lot with Chinese companies, is, um, it can be a slow process because of the cultural, just the language barrier and various other things. What would be important to me is that if you really want to grow out in China, is having people on the ground out there. You know, so, for example, we were, at one point, I was lobbying to get a headcount to hire someone from my team to, to work on the Chinese community. Uh, ultimately, it didn't really come together. Um, but um, in my mind, it was really important that that person would be living in China. Um, I think I've got the mic over here. Who's got the mic? Yeah, yeah. The hand there you are. First with a hand up. Uh, <laughs> since, since you brought up the business model question, is you know what? Well, how do you see that evolving? And particularly in the context of that cloud, where there seems to be a lot of open room to run and a world in search of business models, is that something you can see evolving? Or it is part of the IP side of it. I don't understand, but I worry about how this thing gets supported. On so yeah, so let's talk about break those that down. Um, on the business model side of things, the caveat here is I'm not an expert by any stretch. To me, there's a couple of opportunities here 
particularly on the cloud side, which is also on Ubuntu. The first thing is Ubuntu, the way I look at it is it's kind of broken into a couple of different areas. You've got Ubuntu as a platform um, that's, that's powering cloud, and then you've got the orchestration piece as well. And I tend to think of that as in terms of Ubuntu that's, that's the platform. You know, if you look at the significant number of people and what they're running on the cloud, they're running Ubuntu. And then you've got tools like Juju and Snappy stepping into this arena as well about how you orchestrate all of these different services. I think where we've seen a cultural kind of change over the years in the cloud side of things is these days I don't think that many people care as much about the operating system. They care about the orchestration of that operating system in different, in, in different contexts. And that's why I'm really happy to see that Ubuntu is not just trying to be an operating system that will work real well on the cloud, because that's a, that's an important piece, but it's really about like how do you how do you visualize and outline what you want your infrastructure to be and to deploy that quickly and easily. And that's why I think things like Maz and, and Juju and all these different pieces are really important. In terms of the business models that can come out of that, I think there will always be an eternal challenge, much as I think this is a great problem to have, with the fact that there has been such a commitment to Ubuntu, in Ubuntu for everything to be free, that by definition when you have things that are free, it means that you lose the business model of being able to charge people obviously for free licenses and things like that. But I think that that can also open up interesting opportunities for these like custom development, um, custom deployments and, and delivery and things like that. So the, the, the thing that I don't know is how addressable that market is, is how many companies would want to go to Canonical and say we want to pay you to build our cloud or to, to, to deploy this set of services. Um, what I think is cool is that Canonical are focusing on big markets like telcos and government because those contracts can obviously not only bring validity to the brand, but also they can bring in additional revenue that can continue to develop. In terms of the IP side of things, like I say, my only feedback here is I just think that the, the more we can reduce the ambiguity there, the more we can, I think this is right now, it's, it is an elephant in the room and it shouldn't be. And I think the more we can clear that up and move on from that, because what irritates me as an Ubuntu user and fan is that I think this this story is misrepresented often in the press. But I also understand and sympathize with some of the questions around it. Um, so the sooner I think we can bring clarity to that and we can move on and focus on what's important. Better. You're not allowed to speak. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. Um, on the on the question of support and sustainability, what I see is that there's been a step function change in Canonical's engagement with the enterprise in the last two years. We've obviously been Ubuntu's been at the heart of a huge amount of change inside of enterprises over the last ten years, driven by developers with a lot of passion and enthusiasm. What's changed in the last two years is that is that uh, institutions are now starting to think about the infrastructure in a whole different way. They're thinking about uh, a single infrastructure, for example, if you build a cloud, it's a single complex infrastructure with all of those little applications sitting on top. It's all the same little applications on all the operating, same operating systems that they were running on, but you've now got this very kind of critical, huge scale thing underneath it all. And why, when that's built on Ubuntu, almost inevitably we engage commercially with those companies. So that's been the driver of the step function sort of shift from developers using Ubuntu inside organizations to organizations engaging with ultimately helps make that platform sustainable. It's a good thing and I'm glad you care. Um, on the IP question, let me ask you a simple question. Um, if it turned out that there was an image of Ubuntu on the cloud that had been put there by a malicious actor that had a, a delicious, juicy looking scaled out MySQL deployment on it, it just also happened to send all the passwords that you used when you used that image off to some nefarious company or state agency. Imagine that scenario, that's a real shift scenario. Should we, as a community or as a company, be able to say stop? To me, the answer is definitively, absolutely, totally yes. And Evan Moglen and other leading people in open source completely agree, right? So that's the definitive right that we give ourselves with Ubuntu, which is to say, look, we make this thing available and we go to a, long, a lot of trouble to make sure that anybody can download it and know that they're getting a good thing. You get that in a slightly modified form somewhere out there on the cloud, 
you don't know what you're getting. And generally, we actually go to a lot of trouble to make it easy for community members and so on to do that. We don't want to create bureaucracy, but we absolutely have to retain the right to say, you know, we're, we're not comfortable with that set of bits out there that masquerade as a bit. Right? That doesn't stop anybody from using Ubuntu the way they want to use it, but it allows us to essentially say, we can set some, some have, we, can, we can set a bar for confidence effectively in the back. And so I, I honestly think a lot of that, that story is completely misrepresented. People don't really understand it. It, it gets tied up in a lot of fud. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think you'll find that the great free software projects are the ones that actually really do care, that when you get their stuff, you can have confidence in it. That gets tied into a lot of commercial things, it gets tied into a lot of scaremongering, but at the end of the day, I think it's an important value that you scam. Thanks, Josh. All right, thank you. Questions? Any more questions? Founder of Ubuntu or something. <laughs> so my question is, I'm going to throw a question back at you that you threw out earlier. You asked people to uh, hold up their mic or cell phones. Do you have an Ubuntu phone? And the second piece of that question is because I've had trouble finding. It. So I um, I have an Ubuntu phone. I don't use it in my daily life. Uh, I used to when I was a commodity. And the main reason for that is because there's a certain set of things that I use on my Android phone that um, aren't currently available in, in a meaningful way. Anymore. So I use things like um, Lyft and Uber, and they, there's like web versions of it, but I want the Lyft thing, right? you know, I want the, I want those to stick out. Um, I use things like Skype quite a lot. So for me, it's, it's one of those things where I basically have I have my Ubuntu phone at home that I'm regularly updating. You know, I've got the updates coming in, I've got my Ubuntu phone, and I've got the, uh, well, I did have the Ubuntu you phone, know, I gave it to my friend, George Baylor. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm basically keeping on top of like, what's going on. But my daily driver is, is my, it's plugged in, um, <laughs> it's this. Um, and my plan is that, you know, when I can get to the point where I can replace this with Ubuntu, I'll absolutely um, and how do you get one, did you say? I mean, you can go buy it right now, right? I think you buy it from the in my view. So I think you have to have it shipped over here. And that's, the, that's, the other, that's the other downside. Yeah, and that's the other downside living in the U.S. as well. In, in, for example, the, the BQ anonymizer phone is, you know, is the wireless connection side of things. Like, I don't think... I tried it once with my Maizu and I was getting really slow down my speed. Like that. Like it, it works as a phone. Um, the other thing as well um, is I think there is, uh, with any kind of software, there is like a kind of vibe. There is a just when it feels right. And what's funny about a bunch of phones to me is it feels right, it's just got bits missing. So it's not like it's got all the bits and it doesn't feel right. Basically, the idea of the um, forget how it was originally described to me. It's something like the um, get all the exciting crap in it first kind of uh, release. Um, I honestly, I'm in two minds about it. I, I, in my mind, there is like this, this kind of two layers of release management. On one layer, there is how do you manage the individual pieces of those releases, and then how do you manage the support of those releases. So for example, um, I, you know, this is one of the reasons why I think the LTS is a good thing. I have Ubuntu powering my server, and I run the LTS version from that. I don't want to be updating those servers. Like, like, I just haven't got time or interest in doing that. However, my laptop, 
I do want stuff there. I want all the new stuff. And it's ironic, like psychologically, I think, the difference of when you're very, very, like when I was a canonical, I was obviously very actively part of Ubuntu, and I'm less active than Ubuntu these days. So back then, I was running the developer version of Ubuntu all the time. I was pulling everything in. And it, it's very, very rarely broke. Uh, these days, I have I have two machines. I've got a Mac, uh, and I've got an Ubuntu machine. And my Ubuntu machine always has the most recent version, and I keep it up to date. And then I basically use PPAs for things that, uh, that I want. The idea of moving to a rolling release of Ubuntu, I think, would be brilliant. The concern I have is the quality of implications of that. I think these days, we've got the potential to do that, because we have QA infrastructure that we didn't have when this was discussed a while back. But the QA infrastructure today is primarily uh, tied into the code that we're building, primarily tied to Unity and Neo and stuff like that. So that's got loads of automated testing and all that stuff. But I don't think we have that for the wider platform. And the other concern I have is, is the relationship we have with Debian. Because right now, we have a very similar relationship with Debian. When you go to a rolling release, you know, you basically stable. Like, how does that work? You talked about the uh, re your recommendations for uh, Canonical and Ubuntu, and then you talked about the Ubuntu projects that Canonical is kind of focused on right now and the community is focused on. I'm curious to hear what you're actually excited about as far as, like, if you were to look at the projects that are under the Ubuntu umbrella right now, what excites you the most? That's a great question. Um, Unity 8 really excites me. We always have. Um, I'm really excited about you and the um, The My view of Unity is kind of mixed and matched around a little bit, uh, primarily around scopes. I'm less into scopes now than I used to be. Um, I think scopes is interesting, where I think that it doesn't... Scopes don't solve my problem. I think scopes solve, solve problems for lots of other people. Um, what I think has been really cool is watching how the design of Ubuntu and the development of building apps of Ubuntu evolved, and how that's going to fit into the Unity as a desktop environment. So, for example, we see these beautiful apps. You know, John Lee down here on the design team and his his colleagues like do incredible work designing the guidelines of how you build beautiful apps. Uh, and we have to bear in mind that without wishing to test this version, dial your memory back to these early, early days of Linux and open source. Not a lot of very good designers. <laughs> like some of these apps look horrible. We don't have that in the book. We have beautiful looking apps, and it's thanks to those design guidelines and the SDK. But I'm really curious to see how those apps are going to look in a desktop environment. Because I think one of the things that Microsoft has taught us is that if your desktop environment feels like a slightly higher res resolution tablet, it's annoying. You know, we like clicking and engaging in a rich user interaction with our desktops. And, you know, Microsoft's whole, like, swipey, Windows 7, it's just, yeah. So I'm really curious to see what that looks like. I remember talking to John a couple of years back and saying, so is the, Ubuntu, is the Unity desktop, Unity 8, are you thinking that it will be basically just the same look and feel as Unity 7? He's like, no, we don't have to necessarily do that. We can, the world is our oyster to, to evaluate that. So I think that's definitely one thing. Um, Snappy, I think, is really interesting and exciting. Um, I haven't tried it yet. Um, and one of the things I love about that is that um, it feels to me like the next logical step in Linux packaging. Because uh, Debian is an incredible system, and Debian packages are incredible, but they're great for people who like making Debian packages. I remember over the years, working with various companies, when well, we'd expect them to build Debian packages to go into Ubuntu, and to get it into the developer release of Ubuntu before we release, otherwise they couldn't use it. So I'm pleased that we've bridged that gap, that that bottleneck that we had, because that was one of the biggest things that hampered us in the Ubuntu for years, was the fact that while Debian is a great platform, the fact that we were constrained by that kind of upload process, solving that was solved in the on the Ubuntu side, on the conversion side of things with the App Store. But the App Store is great when you have a dependency on an SDK. The thing I like about the Snappy approach is that you can pull in all kinds of so I think that's cool. And then to me, what that opens up is the opportunity for empowering, you know, for example, really interesting artificial intelligence crowdfunding campaigns such as Mycroft, which we've never seen. Um, to be really interesting. 
Uh, Jenna, we're almost at the hour. Yep. So may I selfishly get one last question? This is perhaps the most important question, and we can ask you here at scale. Is there a bad voltage live? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you should say that. I have two slides to show you. First thing I wanted to tell you is this. The Ubuntu Leadership Panel. I'd encourage you all to come, because you've all got more questions. So tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. in Ballroom DE, the big one. Um, Mark, Ollie. Um, so Mark Shuttleworth, you all know. Ollie Rees is basically an engineering lead at Canonical. Um, David Canella runs the community team. And then we've got a bunch of community members. I think it's going to be Nathan, Elizabeth, um, and Jose, a bunch of other people. I'm going to be chairing a panel. Um, and I'm going to get these people to say honest things. I'm going to grill them. Uh, but we need your questions. So please come along and check that out. And then interestingly, <laughs> tomorrow night at 8 p.m., we're going to have Bad Voltage Live. Bad Voltage is a podcast I do with some friends and Brian Lundu. Um, <laughs> uh, we're going to be giving away a bunch of prizes like Sega Genesis, get retro games console, Mycroft. $2,600 badass workstation, diaries and laptop. We're going to have some free beer and soda or whatever else. It's going to be really a lot of fun. So I'd encourage you to all come along tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>